Adrian Autry and company continue to receive good news after piece of good news after piece of good news. And it's hinted at. And we think that the newest piece of good news means that Jesse Edwards will be staying at Syracuse for year number five. What does that mean for the team? What does that mean for the rotation? Let's break it all down. It's your Locked On Syracuse Thursday. Let's have some fun. Our Locked On Syracuse, your daily podcast on the Syracuse Orange, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Good morning. Happy Thursday, everybody. Owen Valentine here with your Locked on Syracuse Thursday episode. Thank you for making Locked on Syracuse your first listen today and every day. We're free and available wherever you get your podcasts. It's been a few days since we've last caught up. I was moving on Tuesday. Didn't have the Wi-Fi set up yesterday, so we are back. It is Thursday morning, getting underway, and we've got some exciting content to break down today on our first episode in the new house. I'm going to start adding a little bit more, a lot of similar stuff in terms of setup from the last spot, uh, but we will uh, see what we can add. And I'm thinking uh, I got a couple ideas brewing, so we'll see how those come up in terms of the background as we move forward here. Uh, But we got some big news. Yesterday, uh, there was some reading into and some comments that uh, the guys over at Noons read into really well and put out an article yesterday, and things sort of started to spin from there in terms terms of people jumping on board and saying, yeah, that sounds right. Seems like it works. Uh, and it was based on comments from Adrian Autry, who said that if they're not in the everyone's coming back, was the quote that was really read into, was the quote that sort of set some bells off or some sensors off, saying that this is not what we probably expected to happen in the transfer portal for Syracuse this offseason. We talked about it all the time. Uh, closing out the season, even during the season, all the way back to when Bones was on here. We were talking about how this seemed like a mix and seemed like a group where position battle-wise, team-wise, change-wise, things like that, you were going to have guys that inevitably entered the port. And I think Syracuse got off. If this news is correct, if this idea is right and deserves to be moved forward with, Pretty much scot-free. You lose Symir Torrance, who, no offense to Symir, great kid, easily replaceable, in all honesty, right? You can replace Symir Torrance without all too much difficulty. And a guy in Quidier Copeland can probably replace him and overcome him relatively easily in year two. And that's more of a compliment to Quidier than it is a knock on Symir. I want that to be in there. And you lose Joe Girard, who, although is a top 20 scorer in Syracuse history, who, although uh, averaged 16 and change per game last season, I think a lot of people are on the same boat that him entering the portal was what was best for this team at this point in time, making the jumps that they want to make. And him staying sort of hindered the future and the development for this team and for this program. So I think people are okay and excited to see Joe in the portal and Simeon is very recoverable in the portal. And, you know, John Bull, love the guy, right? Unbelievable uh, team player, hustle guy, uh, will fill up every stat except for actually scoring. Uh, Energy, love to see what he did on the bench. In terms of on-court production, you're not losing anything. Right. There was a spurt where he was playing a little bit where the forwards were up in the air. Benny wasn't playing. Some guys were struggling, whatever. I think Benny was sick or whatever it might have been. Played a little bit. Replaceable. If this news is correct and Jesse Edwards is coming back, this also locks in not really guys that we were worried about, but it's, it's nice to know in theory that this is going to be solidified. Guys like Justin Taylor, guys like Malik Brown. Uh, are also going to be coming back uh, at this point in time. Moni or Hima, not that that was a concern. Uh, Peter Carey, not really a guy that was of concern. But all of these names now 
you can sort of move forward with a little bit, lock it in a pinch in terms of what this means for next season. And it also means that your roster is getting pretty solidified at this point in time with a couple of minor question marks. And that's sort of where we will go uh, in terms of the rest of this episode after we break a little bit down. The biggest news from that announcement or from that article or reading into Autry's quote is that Jesse Edwards is back for year five. Jesse Edwards, a guy who has grown tremendously in his four years already at Syracuse, uh, can be an absolute menace when he wants to be. And this is huge news for Syracuse. Unfortunately, it does mean that the Hunter, uh, the Hunter Dickinson comments, ideas, the fever dream, pipe dream, smoke and mirrors, whatever you want to call it, uh, will probably be brushed to the side. I would be astonished if anything in terms of Syracuse even reaching out at this point to Dickinson would come from this point on with Jesse coming back. Just because it doesn't seem like the style of play that Autry wants to go with. It seems like he wants to get out and run, get out and move. And having two bigs in some capacity, and I was corrected, probably correct, um, that Dickinson would have played the four, Jesse would have played the five, because Dickinson can shoot the ball uh, in, in some capacity. Uh, but having that too big rotation, that too big lineup, didn't fit what we're hearing from Autry. So it most likely means that Dickinson is out of the picture, right? I would be astonished to hear otherwise. But I like this over Dickinson for some reasons, right? I think Dickinson is a better player. And I, I'm not going to go out here and say that I think Jesse is better than him. But I like the continuity aspect. And I think that is the biggest piece of this, is the continuity in terms of knows the coaches, knows the bulk of this team already, knows Central New York, is a guy who seems comfortable um, in Syracuse, likes what he's doing, likes what has happened so far. I, I like that continuity aspect. And that is also, I, I can say the same thing for Autry as well, in terms of the coaching change. Would a national search have been cool? Yeah, I think so. But if you're thinking smooth transition, Autry presents the most likely opportunity for smooth transition. And that is where I, I, I'm excited for this. And, and in terms of Autry, he has absolutely been outstanding since taking over as the head coach at Syracuse, getting out on the recruiting trails, bringing in a guy in Brennan Strong who is already showing those local ties things of that nature, bringing guys to the table. Will every single person that knows Brennan Strong commit to Syracuse? No, we know that. We're not expecting that. But you are getting, it appears, deeper in conversations. And kids look like they really want to play for a guy in Brennan Strong and want to play for this new look Syracuse team under the helm of Red Autry, who has shown that he is willing to get out and talk to players and be a consistent presence out there day in and day out on the recruiting trails, going to kids' games, going to their games, again, meeting them at practices, having these conversations, things that you didn't see as often out of Jim Beheim. And that is going to go a long way. This has been probably, uh, we're, we're pushing a month since Syracuse uh, lost to Wake Forest to close out the season in the ACC tournament. This has been an astounding month in terms of good news for Syracuse basketball. I'm going to knock on wood because I don't want to put the jinx on by any means. The wooden desk has been knocked on. The news that we have gotten, every time big news breaks for Syracuse, has been pretty damn good. What's the worst thing that's happened? Judas testing the NBA draft waters, which I don't think anybody was really shocked to see happen. Good news after good news after good news. Jesse Edwards back in the 315 for a year number five with the possibility of, I mean, between him and Baycott, who, who seem like the grandfathers of the ACC at this point in time, could throw a couple other names in there. Kihei Clark has now graduated from the grandfather clause of the ACC. Uh, a couple other guys in that mix as well. But those are two bigs that could put up numbers. 
when they want to. We're going to take a quick break. We're going to talk FanDuel, continue talking a little bit of Jesse after the break, and then we'll take a look at what this rotation might look like next year, knowing how many pieces that are already locked in based on these comments from Autry uh, that were reported on yesterday and started the stirring of this conversation. Let's talk a little FanDuel. We are almost at the NBA playoffs, and now is the perfect time to download FanDuel. It's America's number one sports book because new customers get a no-sweat first bet up to $1,000. That's bonus bets back if your first bet doesn't win. Just download the FanDuel Sportsbook app. It's safe, secure, super easy to use. Then you can bet on everything from the money line to point scores to threes drained. That would be spreads, money lines, totals, player props, points, rebounds, assists, blocks, even many more exclusive bets like the two by three. Plus it's Masters week. The Masters are teeing off. Everybody loves to throw a little bet on the Masters, make things spicy, make things spicy. Have a little fun. Enjoy the Masters. Maybe you throw a little wager down. Plus, FanDuel even lets you combine your bets for a bigger payout with same-game parlays. So don't miss the chance to get your no-sweat first bet up to $1,000 in bonus bets when you go FanDuel.com slash locked on. That is FanDuel.com slash locked on to learn more. Make every moment more with FanDuel. It's an official sports betting partner of the NBA. All right, breaking down Jesse Edwards a little bit more, and then we'll take to Twitter. We've got some questions about the rotation questions about what this means moving forward, some other things up in the air. Uh, So we'll roll with that right now. But first, a little more on Jesse. For this Jesse news, I I think everyone's excited, right? I don't think anybody wanted to deal with Jesse leaving. And maybe you miss out on a guy like Dickinson. Maybe you don't get anyone in the portal. And now you have to rely on Monir Hima to make a gigantic jump at Syracuse or a guy like Peter Carey to make a gigantic jump at Syracuse. I think people like that Jesse allows you to have that answer and not have to rely on, you know, getting a big time transfer player, which would be a very difficult get, right? Because of the level of programs that are going to be reaching out to a guy like Dickinson without question. But also when you now have this and you know, you've got a guy that can put up double doubles. But this is what you need for this to be the best case scenario is Jesse Edwards, and I'm gonna call him out right now on Locked On Syracuse. I want Jesse Edwards to get tough in this off season, become a bully down low, an absolute bully in the paint where it doesn't matter who is guarding you, who you're matched up against, who you are playing against, He is going to show you dominant performances every single night. You've seen it at times, right? You saw Jesse Edwards go absolutely nuts against Wake Forest to close out the regular season and Jim Beheim's final game in the Dome. You saw what he could do. He put up, what, 6,000 points and 6 billion rebounds in that game. You can see him dominate. He does it. But I want that to be consistent. I want that to be an every night kind of thing, whether you are playing a a 6'8 freshman at the center in a non-conference game or a 7,000th year senior in Armando Baycott who is going to come and try and body you. I don't want it to matter who is on the other side, what their play style is, what they're doing. I want Jesse to make that jump. Maybe it's putting on a little bit more muscle, getting a little bit more size in terms of a little bit of that true center frame a bit more. I like the mobility that we started to see out of him. He can actually put the ball on the ground every once in a while and get past his man, finish at the rim. It's kind of cool to see. But I want to see that jump in terms of physicality, in terms of toughness for Syracuse to truly, truly elevate based on this news. If Jesse doesn't make that jump, maybe Syracuse is a tournament team in terms of slightly on the bubble getting in next year. And that's relying on some other factors as well that we'll jump into. If Jesse makes this jump, Syracuse is in the tournament. If they are not on the bubble, they're going to be a fringe Top 25 team, if you can see that jump out of Jesse Edwards. 
That is the potential that this team can have given Jesse making a jump. And I, I, I don't want that to come off as a knock on Jesse Edwards, but I want to start a fire under him. I want him to get fired up. I want him to come out with that you can't touch me mentality that he was playing with, that pure domination mentality that you saw against Wake Forest when he went nuts and nobody could do anything to stop him. And the confidence he had in post-game interviews. I want that to be the embodiment of Jesse Edwards every time you see him because we know it can happen. It just doesn't always happen. If that goes through, and that is what we start to see. That Syracuse team next season is going to have endless potential. There are a couple other variables that we will start to chat right now. But that team is going to be a team to beat, a team that you don't want to see, and a team that you are a little bit worried every time their name comes up on the schedule. This could be. And maybe I'm overreacting. If you think so, let me know. It's okay. It's a conversation. I'm on my own right now. I don't have anyone coming back at me, so that's your job in the comments. Come back at me. It's okay. This team could set Syracuse back on the trajectory that you saw it on as it was joining the ACC, leading up to that 2014 team that was unbelievable that won game after game after game after game. This could be the year if Jesse Edwards makes a jump, and as we'll talk next, if Judah comes back for year two, this could be a team that sets Syracuse back up for what the fan base has been icking for, yearning for, and needing for the past, I don't know, five, ten years even pushing back to 2014 maybe. Yes, there have been good years. I'm not going to deny that. A Final Four run, multiple Sweet 16s. But I think this fan base, and correct me if I'm wrong, is striving for not just an overperform in the tournament type year, not that you'd complain, right? Any tournament run is fun. But a regular season that reflects that. Not a team that astonishes the world to get to the Sweet 16, But a team that makes the tournament to a point where you're like, yeah, they can make the Sweet 16 easily because of the regular season that they had. A full, what is it, five-month season, six-month if you really make a run. A full five-month season where Syracuse is playing at the level where they want. All right, we're going to take the Twitter because we got some questions that we want to discuss on there. Uh, Talking a little bit about the news that's happened in the two days since we've last chatted, right? Monday was our last episode. Today, uh, we got some big news for the Thursday episode. Uh, We'll start with Ryan Cuse on Twitter. Wanted to talk the way too early look at potential rotations for next year. And there's a few caveats here. Assuming the Jesse news is accurate and that Judah stays. He says he counts eight guys that he'd like to see have good roles, and that doesn't include a backup center. Do we think Autry will go deeper than Bayheim did in the rotation? So I sort of charted it out. Um, if Judah comes back, which was part of the question, I think you're starting guards. I think you've got Judah at the one, Starling at the two. Starling shoots the ball a little bit better. Seems like that would be the thing. I would anticipate a guy like Quadir Copeland to be the third guard, probably playing maybe 10 minutes a game would be my assumption in terms of rest minutes, in terms of a foul and foul trouble, whatever it might be. I see JJ, I see Judah as 30, 35 minute guys without question. And Quidier sort of supplementing uh, the, the one and two spot. Now the, the mix in there is something that we've been up in the air about. And that's Justin Taylor. Is he going to switch to the two? He's going to play the two and the three. I think we can assume. And Taylor could be in there in that rotation in the guard spot. Say, for example, you know, if Quidier doesn't make that jump that we think he can, and Justin does, right? That is something that could happen. Without question, that is something that could happen. So between those two, I think you're going to see 
10-ish minutes at the guard spot coming up right there. The forwards, I think you've got a trio in Malik Brown, Benny Williams, and Chris Bell that are going to chop those forward minutes up pretty evenly is the guesstimate. I would assume someone in this group of Malik, Benny, and Chris Bell are going to make quite a jump or is going to make quite the jump. I think you can bank on one of those three guys coming back next season, a new man, a changed player who's ready to come out and score and be a scoring option at a greater clip than we saw last season. We saw spurts from each of them. Malik Brown early on coming in as a huge spark. Benny Williams closed out the season really well. Chris Bell also had some good games down the stretch, shot the ball a little bit better, a little bit more aggressive rebounding. You've seen that from each of them. I think one of them makes the jump to do it more consistently next year. They will get the bulk of the minutes at one of the spots, and then you're going to see the other two rotating in at that other slot, maybe giving some rest minutes, things like that. And Justin Taylor seems like the guy that is going to supplement both at the guard and forward spot. Maybe you've got a guy in foul trouble and you put, I'm pure hypothetical here. Maybe uh, Benny Williams is not the starter um, at either of the forward spots. You got, you know, Malik Brown's got three fouls in the first half. You put Benny in, doesn't quite have it. Taylor's going to now sub in at one of the forward spots. Same thing goes at the guards, right? Judah picks up two early fouls. You put Quadir Copeland in, doesn't really work the way you want it to. Justin Taylor can easily slot up there with JJ at the one. No questions. That is sort of where I see this rotation looking at this point in time. And at this point, that is seven players, eight, uh, with Jesse at the five. I'm looking at that, and I, I see Jesse at the five right now, and I think we're on the same page with those eight. Here's the question mark. What does Peter Carey come back looking like? What kind of player is he when he returns? Because he was a guy that when we saw him early on, looked like he needed to improve, looked like he needed to strengthen up, toughen up, get a little bit stronger, a little bit better basketball-wise. He's got the height without a doubt. I think he's got that potential. He's got the skills in a bit raw of a form. What kind of player does he come back as? Because he's a guy that if you do ever want to go big, could play a four, type of player that could play the four. Uh, the same question is now Monir Hima, right? Can he do anything more offensively? He was fine defensively for a lot of last season. A bit of an offensive, he's a non-factor, right? A non-factor compared to Jesse seems like a big drop because Jesse can score, and we know Jesse can score. You've got this other variable in William Patterson, who is he a four, is he a five? We're not necessarily set in stone on. And also a guy that similarly to Peter Carey is coming in as a player who's tall, not necessarily a player who is refined uh, and has this refined skill set, right? A raw player with height. You cannot teach height, not even kind of. Right, You've got the height. You've got a guy who is getting there basketball-wise. He's probably a guy that needs a year or two, most likely. A year or two to develop, strengthen, figure out the transition from high school ball to the college level. I don't think that's a long shot for me to say. Is there a chance he comes in and is a big contributor? Sure. I don't think that is the most likely outcome here. So right now, I'm saying your guard rotation is going to be Jude at the one, JJ at the two, with Quadir probably coming in for 10-ish minutes a game. Malik Brown, Benny Williams, Chris Bell rotating the forwards. I don't know, you got 80 minutes between the three of them. Maybe you go 25, 25, 25. Maybe you got a guy that's going to be going 35, and your other two are going 25 and 20. You got Justin Taylor, who is going to probably fluctuate between the two and the three. I would assume 10-ish minutes a game, maybe. 
10, 15 a game, guy that can come in off the bench as a spot up shooter, as a guy that can be an explosive scorer from the bench in terms of shooting. And he is going to be a guy that I think has severe potential to really jump and surpass that 10 minutes a game threshold, that 10 to 15 threshold that you're expecting. Because as you look at this team, they don't really have incredible three-point shooting threats. We know Judah's not a great three-point shooter. Starling is a better three-point shooter than Judah, not incredible by any means. Chris Bell can shoot the three. Benny Williams sometimes can shoot the three. Actually, Benny shot 39% from three. I'm going to say Benny Williams can shoot the three. But Justin Taylor, as a guy that can shoot, is going to be the player that has the potential to really surpass us in terms of what the assumed minutes might be next season. And Taylor could come out of the blue and start at the three for all we know, right? That is the type of skill, the type of shooter that he could be. We have a lot of pieces up in the air in terms of that rotation. I'm going to say, to walk away from this answer, that uh, I think it was Cuse Ryan on Twitter said eight-man rotation. I'm going to say nine to start. Actually, I'm going to say 10 to start. I think you're going to see Hema and Carey battling it out a little bit in terms of that backup center role. I think it's going to sort of refine to like an eight and a half man rotation where it's going to be Jesse and less Jesse's in trouble foul wise. That's where I'm getting the sort of half. I think this is a team that is going to want to play without a backup center for as much as they possibly can. And I think whoever wins that battle, whether it's a battle or not, between Hema and Carey will be that 0.5 to supplement at the center if Jesse gets into foul trouble or if, uh, I, I don't know what it is, something happens Jesse-wise where, you know, he's hurt for a game, whatever that might be. Uh, but that's sort of where I see that rotation. That's where we're going to have to wind up today. Uh, there's a couple more questions on Twitter. Uh, we'll probably end up chatting them a little bit at the end of Friday's episode, but we are pushing the 30-minute mark right now, so we're wrapping things up here uh, for your Locked On Syracuse Thursday. Thank you so much for making us your first listen today. If you're looking for some more Locked On College Basketball, check it out. It's our brand-new podcast. Experts Isaac Shade, Andy Patton will bring you everything you need to know on and off the court, plus big-name experts, coaches, players throughout the basketball landscape. It's Locked On College Basketball, available on YouTube and wherever you get your podcasts. Thank you so much for checking in today. I'm Owen Valentine. I hope you have a wonderful wrap up of the week. I'll see you tomorrow. We've got a couple of days off, so it's good to be back. I'm going to try and add a little bit to the background here. We'll see where things go from there. I got some things to do. We're finishing moving in uh, today and tomorrow. So uh, we'll see where this goes. It might be a little bit of a later recording tomorrow as well. Uh, but thank you so much. If you have not, we would love it if you could go ahead and subscribe over here, I believe. New video over there. It uh, goes a long way. Turn that notification bell on. Get instantly notified the second we go live on YouTube. Uh, thank you so much for listening. I'll catch you tomorrow. Have a great day. Make somebody smile today. Go for it. Peace.